number seven for Introduction to Literature and the Environment. We are, of course, at the website for the course, and we just popped open to the full screen view of the lecture. So lecture number seven here, you'll notice, situated firmly in the Roman period. In fact, in terms of our timeline, we are just a little before the beginning of the Christian era, and we are still in Mediterranean for the most part. Last time, as you'll recall, we dealt with pastoral. This lecture is going to continue with that and um, go forward to another form that was popularized by Virgil, and that's Georgic, in a work that's quite appropriately called his Georgics. We'll also be looking at another agricultural manual, which is by Varro from about the same period. But first, um, a little on Virgil, and this is by way of a, a quick summary of what we talked about last time. So keep in mind that pastoral is frequently an urban form. It's Theocritus would be a good example. Theocritus is writing <coughs> probably from the city of Alexandria, where he may in fact have been a member of Ptolemy's court. Probably, I mean, one of the largest cities in antiquity, an amazing city at the time. On the other hand, th it is the case that Theocritus is probably recalling his own rural farm childhood um, in rural Sicily. So, you know, you have this idea that someone from the city is wistfully imagining this perfect pastoral place. And as a consequence, you know, if you want to just buy into the descriptions of the perfect pastoral place, you can do it. But it is useful to think about why this is happening, and really it is a knee-jerk response to dissatisfaction with the world that, that is, you know, um, um, principally urban here. Edward Rotinsky is doing the same thing, except instead of, you know, wistfully talking about the perfect place, he is turning around and sort of unabashedly facing the environmental problems head on and dealing with them. That's a little bit different than what someone like Theocritus does, but the, the net result is the same in that you have this binary opposition between the urban and the idealized rural setting and it is just that in traditional pastoral, we focus on the rural, but we should always remember, and it is a consequence of, and we should be thinking, turn back to look at the urban problems, or at least the problems of uh, um, other environmental problems, the sort that Edward Bertinsky draws our attention to. <coughs> Virgil is doing the same thing as Theocritus. He is picking up on pastoral and he's taking it further. But what he wants to do is, is sort of open up this question of how we become aware of the environment as endangered. Something different than Theocritus is doing. And he also wants to consider the role of human action and human culture in this. We're gonna see this more as we look into Virgil, but a fascinating project. If you recall from the last lecture I mentioned um, from back where I'm from, Santa Barbara, the big oil spill in 1969. Prior to that, of course, people knew that they had a beach and were aware of it. But after the oil spill, in a way, they became more fully aware of it. They became aware of it as endangered. They became aware of it as something that was valuable. Arguably, they developed an environmental consciousness here. Virgil is doing the same thing in his first eclogue. Virgil is talking about how we become aware of an environment um, at its moment of loss to us. So to understand that happen, how that happens, to understand how an environmental consciousness takes place and emerges, we're going to look on a line-by-line -line basis at Virgil's first eclogue. We haven't done that <clears throat> much in this course so far because we've been dealing with these sort of larger themes that move across you know, hundreds of years. But it is interesting and useful to consider something like this, which is a very dense uh, poem, line-by-line -line basis. Also, at the onset, um, it's a very common mistake to, to sort of imagine a false etymology for the word eclog, because it sort of looks like ecology. It sort of has most of the letters there. But the fact is, eclog is entirely unrelated to the word ecology. Ecology comes from was put together, the word was coined in 1866 by Ernst Hegel, a German biologist, from two Latin, two Greek words rather, um, oikos, which becomes the eco here, which means household, and um, logo, 
um, logos ology here, which is um, like science or account. So ecology is literally the account of the household, the account of the relationship that we all have together who are sort of on on the earth. Uh, Eclogs means has nothing to do with that. It simply means selections in ancient Greek. So um, looks similar, but isn't. So Virgil's first eclog is what we want to, to look at here uh, from the very beginning. So you have two characters, Meloboas and Tityrus, the only two characters in the eclog, in the poem. The first Meloboas starts off the very beginning by um, talking about the environment and he's attempting to draw his friend's attention to it. He is essentially saying, look, Tityrus, my friend, look at the spreading beach over there. Look at the, let's talk about the woodland views. Look at these sweet fields. Look at these woods. Uh, from the very beginning, literally the first lines, Meloboas is trying to make Tityrus aware of their environment. They're both in the middle of it, but they're talking about other things. And Meloboas is saying, well, wait, let's just stop for a moment and look at what's going on here. Now, why does he do it? We learn very quickly that Meloboas is being exiled from his farm. Both Tityrus and Meloboas are farmers. They both have been there for many years. Tityrus is now losing his farm. And in the process, and we've talked about this last time, and I mentioned this is an observation made by Heidegger and others in the early part of the 20th century, um, Meloboas is now acutely aware of it. My example from before works here as well. Imagine you have a friend, your friendship goes on for years and years, you don't really think much about the friendship, suddenly one of you moves away and the friendship just sort of explodes into relief for you. Suddenly you see it as if for the first time and how valuable it is. Similarly, Meloboas is being exiled from his farm. From that instant he sees it, how beautiful it is, and he wants to explain this to Titerus. Um By the way, the translation from the Latin here is is mine, but it's truly it's very faithful to the original. <coughs> Meloboas then starts by drawing attention to the fields and their environment. Tityrus responds by drawing attention to the political situation, while remaining oblivious to Meloboas' attempt to foreground the environment. An odd conversation going here. Tityrus says, "Look, look at this beautiful environment here." Tityrus ignores what he says and starts talking about politics. Meloboas then continues to observe the, the environment and how in the fields everywhere there is so much turmoil. So not only is you know, he drawing attention to the fields and what's going on there, he wants to tell Meloboas, Titerus, that something is very, very wrong. Titerus um, has been oblivious to the environment, but now he's, Meloboas is cranking it up and saying, well, look, something's wrong. We need to talk about this. Tityrus, however, again ignores Meloboas in the fields, and he starts talking about his patron, um, who is, and it's not mentioned in the uh, Eclog, but we know is very likely Caesar Augustus in Rome. An odd inclusion then, you know, Meloboas saying, look, something's really wrong going on here, look around, something's wrong. Meloboas, uh, Tityrus says, let's talk about my patron in Rome. Um, two things are happening, right? One is a very literal discussion of the environment, <coughs> the other a discussion of politics. This opposition will continue throughout the Eclogue. Meloboas is repeatedly talking about the environment, directing attention to the environment, suggesting something is wrong there. Tityrus keeps ignoring it, wanting to talk about politics. I'm going to keep this uh, focus on politics in mind because we have talked about how allegory is functioning. We'll see this here. From this very opening uh, words, it is clear that Meloboas, because he is exiled from his farm, because he has lost what he has taken for granted for many years, has now developed an environmental consciousness. Think of the residents of Santa Barbara. Suddenly, you know, they see their their 
beach. It's now covered with oil. Suddenly, for the first time, they see it. They see its value. They see its importance. They wish that they had it back the way it was. That's what Meloboas is going to, to do throughout here. He doesn't want to leave. He's being exiled, but he wants everything back the way it was. He's acutely conscious of his environment in a way that he never was before. He then tries to communicate that environmental consciousness to his friend Titerus. He is not successful. Yeah, it's an important note to make here. The exile motif, which existed before Virgil, and exists after becomes very important in Western civilization, and Virgil is a good is is is, is in part responsible for that because his um, change to it here is important. But he's talking about the same thing we are: environmental consciousness. But I mean, he's not talking about the environment having changed. He's talking about having to leave it and what that means for for you. And the reason um, he would approach it this way, I w he approaches it this way, I would argue, is because we know that Virgil himself actually lost his um, farm. And he is actually able to inhabit the character of Meloboas so successfully because he knows just how Meloboas feels. He felt the very same thing. So his insight on how he developed an environmental consciousness is especially poignant because it is, it is personal. Continuing with the poem, line by line way, Meloboas pointedly um, notes how Titerus has neglected um, in more ways than one his own field. So not only is now Meloboas you know, directing attention to the environment, suggesting that something is wrong there, but he is suggesting that Titerus has been neglectful. And why has he been neglectful? Because he's actually been visiting Rome, spending too much time there, sort of getting in good with his patron, Caesar Augustus. Titerus, uh, Meloboas is, is saying, but you know, there's a problem here, Titerus. The very pines, Titerus, the very springs, the very orchard have called out for you, but you were not there. You were in Rome. So the farm, Titerus's farm, what he is responsible for, has not been taken care of, you know, in this very anthropomorphic way that's imagined as crying out to him. Uh, Meloboas, on the other hand, has been taking care of his farm. So you have this opposition going on here, and we'll see the consequences of that. <coughs> so, in the beginning, from the very beginning, Titerus has been ignoring the environment right before his eyes. I mean, it's there. Meloboas is saying, look at this, look at this. Titerus not paying attention at all. But in another sense, he's ignoring the fields in the sense that he's not taking care of them. He is not being a good steward. He's not doing the job of what a farmer should do. And as a consequence, he's you know ignoring in a double sense. And for our purposes, he's not becoming conscious of his environment, not developing an environmental conscious. So in the language of the poem, Titerus wants to to let Meloboas wants Titerus to hear, you know, the 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 fields calling out to him, and he launches into two very long concluding speeches, both of which provide descriptions of the surrounding environment. So, the first of these, Meloboas tries to draw Titerus' attention to various features of the environment, you know, familiar streams, bees for feeding on willow blossoms, and a variety of birds. Uh, and Virgil is very clear here, unless you, lest you want to think that streams are meant to be symbolic in some way, as are willow blossoms, um, that these are very specific willow blossoms. Uh, he uses, um, in one of the reasons it's important to go back to the original language here, Latin, uh, kind of obscure words. You know, you could be talking about something like the, the bold eagle, you know, and that could be probably would be allegorical. But these are willow blossoms. These are not something that would be imbued with that sort of allegorical meaning. And, and he wants to do that, I would argue, because Virgil wants to make sure that we know that these are real, local plants and animals. There's nothing allegorical about the way Meloboas is approaching things. This is a literal description of the environment that's going on here. Titerus then starts um, 
talking again about the political situation, which Meloboas has been similarly neglecting. So to make, you know, Virgil's very clear, Meloboas is talking about the literal landscape, trying to convey his sense of environmental consciousness, trying to convey why all this is important. But then Titerus suggests that Meloboas himself has been neglectful of his fields. This is an odd thing to say, right? Because we know Meloboas has been staying there and being a good steward and a good farmer. But <clears throat> on the other hand, he hasn't been going to Rome and doing the sort of political, you know, sort of behind-the-scenes action that is necessary to keep his farm. Right. In any event, Meloboas has developed an acute sense of environmental consciousness, and he wants to convey it to Titerus. He wants to draw attention to, he repeatedly tries atten to draw attention to the environment that he has that has been lost behind it, and has been lost to him. In that sense, you know, this is about, a great deal of what the eclogue is about, is emerging environmental consciousness in Meloboas, the desire to communicate it, the failed desire to communicate it on his part. So, give a little backstory here. What happens uh, sometimes, and happened in this period of time, is that the land was principally owned by a monarch. The monarch could do with it as they please. Monarchs gave land um, as a reward for things. So, if you were, you know, successful in wooing your patron, a monarch, that patron could give you land. Um, at least to have for as long as they, they wanted to. Often it was the case when wars were fought that land was given as a reward for, for very faithful soldiers and especially for, <clears throat> for soldiers who were landowners who were able to bring a whole bunch of people to come and fight wars for you. So that's what's happened here. So, Meloboas should have been in Rome, should have been trying to uh, make nice to someone like Caesar Augustus so that his land, his farm, would have been um, insured, so that he would have made sure that he would have gotten it. He didn't do that. So in a very odd way, Titerus has been more careful, um, more carefully a steward of his land because he's been doing the sort of backstage politics necessary to keep his land and Meloboas hasn't been doing that. That's why Meloboas ultimately loses his farm altogether. So Meloboas, of course, is trying to tell Titerus, you know, the very far fields they're calling out to you, Meloboas, to Titerus, you're not there, you haven't been paying attention. And Titerus is saying, well, you know, you haven't been doing your job either. If you would have been in Rome, none of this would have happened, you wouldn't be leaving. Um, Titerus, though, does not have an environmental consciousness, per se, at least certainly the sort that Meloboas had, has. But still, he has a um, sort of savvy understanding of what it takes to, to keep land. If you read it, it, it can be a little confusing sometimes because, as I mentioned, Meloboas is clearly talking about local regional features of the environment, certain kind of willow blossom. Titerus speaks um, what might seem to be in um, uh, terms of nature about cypresses and wayfaring trees, but again, this is meant to be all figurative. This is allegorical. The cypress, you know, they're tall among the trees. They're, it's like the tallest among all trees. It's like Rome. So it plays out on two levels. Very literal on Meloboas is on side. Titerus, rather allegorical. So, continuing. This is what is so fascinating about Virgil. From the point of view of an environmentalist, which we are, it would be easy enough to write um, a story that did just what Meloboas did. Tells the story about how someone got environmental consciousness and desperately tried to communicate it to an adult who just doesn't get it at all. That, that would be a very common story. We're going to see it in modernity again and again and again. 
Virgil is cleverer than that, though. He does deal with things on a very literal level, but he also deals with it on an allegorical level. I mentioned at the onset when we were talking about pastoral that it can be literal and allegorical and it can be a little confusing. Virgil's a master here. He knows that it can be both, and he is using both. And he wants to explain how the political situation, veiled in figurative language, has profound heart-wrenching consequences to the environment. So it's not just that the environment, you know, these heart-wrenching things happen to it, but the political situation impacts it. The allegorical impacts the literal. And that's why these two characters are trying to each explain to the other why it is necessary to think both literally and allegorically or politically at the same time. A little aside, we know that Virgil did become a savvy enough political thinker that he was able to get his farm back. That's part of what happens in the, uh, well, that's what happens in his lifetime. We see it later in one of the other eclogues. But it is a fascinating thing to think about how the liter literal and the physical impact each other. It is naive, Virgil says, just to care about the environment, just to see it as important, just to develop an environmental consciousness. That's great, and you can try to communicate it to people. And, you know, what's fascinating here, Virgil is doing just that. He is attempting to communicate it to us. So, you know, losing his farm, he's developed this consciousness of it, a broad way an environmental consciousness. Now he wants to communicate that to us, and he does so by Meliboas, but he's also, you know, can stand back and look at it and say, well, wait, you know, it's not just enough to know what's happening with the environment and to care about it. You have to be politically savvy here. You have to enter into the realm of culture. You know, nature itself is not enough. This binary exists where culture is here, and it does impact it. You can, you can, you know, talk all day, but we really need to be a little savvy here. You really need to know how to, to make things happen politically so to ensure that the, the, the farm is taken care of. And you can see, in neither case is, is one half um, sufficient. So, yeah, Meliboas, great steward of his farm, wonderful farmer, really took care of it, really now appreciates it and cares about it. But guess what? It means little or nothing because he now has lost his farm. As far as his responsibility to the environment, he has been very remiss. Titerus, on the other hand, in that sense, has not been remiss. He's been solving and he's taken care of it. But as Meliboas says to him, yes, but that may be true, but you haven't been taking care of it in the literal sense. I mean, you know, the, the, the fields are calling out to you. Where are you, good steward, to take care of it? By bringing these two positions together in a dialogue, Virgil is able to draw attention to them both being necessary. And, and interestingly, has them collide together and the discussion that ensues is both sides of it playing out, why both are important. Because Virgil <laughs> explores how environmental consciousness um, emerges, and for other reasons, it's, it's, it's an enormously important work. It's been argued by people, and most recently a book by Annabelle Patterson, not that recent, I guess 1987, but a very influential book called uh, Pastoral Ideology, uh, argues that all pastoral that comes after Virgil is a, a reference to this particular piece. It's just enormously significant. Although I should mention that following Patterson, Paul Alpers, and others, in the last 20 years there's been an enormous focus on the political side of the coin rather than dealing with environmental issues as well. Only in the last couple of years have we begun to see just what Virgil is trying to make us aware of that we need to take into account the environmental as well. Both of them are, are major components of, of what's going on here. So, some concluding remarks on pastoral. First, it's an enormously complex mode of writing. It's not just simply writing about, the, about nature. 
it's undergone you know enormous transformations in the last three thousand years it can be very literal nature writing that's kind of what you know Mello Boas is about describing the natural world why it's beautiful and important it can be allegorical commentary we get that in the first eclat from Tudorus who's talking all about politics or as is the you know the case with the first eclat some combination of the two masterfully brought together by Virgil uh, but we will see, and you will notice when you pick up pastoral um, in subsequent centuries, sometimes it can be mainly one or the other, mainly literal or allegorical. Yeah. It's a fascinating, uh, again, what's fascinating about the first eclogue, it is talking about how human impact, human uh, um, actions impact the environment, how if we're politically savvy, we can help the environment, how that can also mean that we neglect the environment. But more generally, it's drawing attention to, to something that we need to remember throughout this course, that, you know, Human actions can not only impact our relationship to the environment, how we take care of it and are stewards of it, but those actions can also make us aware of it in, in some twisted ways. Uh, it's just an enormously fascinating reflection on the, this whole idea from Virgil. Yeah, so Melibos is changing scenes. He's leaving his farm, you know. Um, it is also the case, and we're going to see it in subsequent uh, literature, especially when we get to the Renaissance of folks like Ben Johnson and Amelia Lanier, how environmental consciousness can emerge when um, people uh, when not when people don't move, but the environment itself changes. So Virgil set up this form that was just, in a way, terror uh, uh, made to explore what happens when environments begin to change dramatically. Not when people change and move away from environments, but when they do. And when that happens, we really get, especially with like Johnson and Lanier, a real focus on the environment, a real sense of environmental consciousness and an awareness of the changes that we made and what they're doing to the environment. Yeah. Um, arguably, 400 years ago with folks like Johnson, um, environmental consciousness comes on the scene just as we're entering modernity and major changes are happening to the environment um, at our hands as a consequence. So that's pastoral. Virgil will actually write three different types of literature, if you didn't know. He writes pastoral in the form of his eclogues. We looked at a few of them. He also writes epic, and he is responding to Homer's Iliad with his own Aeneid, which is a great work. And in the middle, he writes something called Georgics. And give an overview of what Georgics are here. So if you recall, one of the key features of pastoral as we get it from at least as early as Theocritus is this idea of otium, which means leisure. So shepherds are in their fields, leaning against a tree, singing a song. It's all about leisure. Georgic life is, by contrast, one of hard work and agriculture. It is not at all about leisure. It's about why we need to work and work hard and, and why this impacts the environment. So you can, in a very rough way, see a parallel here, and I don't think it's coincidental because, you know, this is all coming out of that same part of the world, that um, prelapsarian life in Eden before the fall, where everything was taken care of, and that's a real parallel to pastoral. Pastoral is like that. It's no work. It's easygoing. And however, that after the fall, Remember Genesis 3.17, you know, and cursed is the ground for thy sake. You're going to have to work hard. This is Adam's punishment, labor. Well, that is like Georgia. Georgia is all about that. It's about, you know, once we have to do what we need to do, we have to work hard. What exactly do we do? Virgil's going to tell us in great detail in the Georgics about that. It's also the case that, you know, um, and again, coming out of the same part of the world, it's not surprising that this is going to be told, and was told another time too, that Hesiod 
talking not about the golden age but the golden race, um, gets picked up on by Ovid, who now talks about the golden age and talking about the iron age as well, where people have to work hard. And, and we saw this in Hesiod too. So you have three separate accounts coming from different traditions all saying the same thing. Judeo-Christian, before the fall there was no labor, the earth took care of us perfectly. After the fall we have to work hard and earn everything by the sweat of our brow. Similarly, the golden age was all that, earth took care of us. The iron age we have to work hard, nobody takes care of us. The eclogues, pastoral literature is about the earth taking care of us and this life characterized by odium. Georgics are about us making our own way and it's important to note, and Virgil, again, being a clever guy, focuses on how this happens, which is agriculturally. So I'll show you actually a, a literal example here in a moment, but Georgic landscapes are those where people are, where the earth is being worked. So in a, in a very rough way, pastoral landscape is going to look like pastures and have you know it's going to have pasture shepherds sheep and all that that's how you know it's a pastoral landscape if you were to see a georgic one you'll see somebody with the plow you'll see things being planted you'll see people harvesting you'll see them doing all these things that are work incidentally the word georgic comes from two greek words gaia which of course means earth and ergon which means to work. So Georgic literally means to work the earth. It is the work of the earth. It is agricultural labor. Uh, labor. You know, you could, of course, see this in, in huge historical terms then as, you know, um, pre-agricultural people live something like a pre-lapsarian pastoral golden age existence. And once agriculture comes on the scene, we're post-lapsarian Iron Age and Georgic. But in any event, it's very clear that Virgil wants us to think about working the earth here with Georgic. So pastoral landscapes are populated by shepherds leisurely standing with their sheep. So this guy, you can see him, he's doing absolutely nothing. He's leaning on his shepherd's staff, his sheep are around him. He's just, he's either, it's kind of hard to tell from this uh, painting, he's either maybe whistling or just contemplating or dreaming. Uh, this, by the way, is from, as you see the caption, Peter Bruegel the Elder from 1558. But that's a good example uh, of what a pastoral would seen look, seen look like, literally shepherds. So Georgic, however, depicts farmers working the land, and that's this guy. He is a farmer. Notice that he has a horse pulling a plow. Notice that um, this is actually turning the soil, but it also looks wonderfully like you know stepped um, architecture that he's actually creating terraces here, which is hard work in a major project. Uh, it's important to note this distinction. You know, coming from where we do much later, you might look at all this and say, "Oh, isn't this just a wonderful pastoral scene?" Um, no, it's not. Half of it is uh, literally pastoral. Half of it's Georgic. We tend to sometimes, in a very rough way, say all this is pastoral because it all looks so beautiful and we'll talk about you know a beautiful farm looking very pastoral or bucolic but in in the terms that that we're using now which are precise terms regarding the form and the one that developed um, there is a distinction between the two they're actually very different landscapes um, so uh, just keep in mind that our modern perspective will often look back on any older perspective and you see a farm from 1558 and it's just going to look wonderfully pastoral <clears throat> even though you know depending on what's being done it could be very very georgic so if you think about it and you stand back from an environmental point of view even though they may look very the same very similar um, even the same they are environmentally very different right one um, doesn't imagine human beings interacting directly with the environment at all. Of course, we know from Andy Goldsworthy in our previous discussion that pastoral landscapes are, in some sense, built or certainly modified environments because of uh, deforestation and the um, continual application of sheep. But it is the case that 
Georgic is abs is much more um, involved with modification, active modifications to the environment, active changes to the environment, and continuing to to uh, maintain those changes through the application of Georgic labor. So that's just an overview of Georgic. So now let's look at Virgil's Georgics in particular. If okay, so. The Virgil's Georgics are written right before the beginning of the Christian era, um, and probably right after his eclogues. And remember, Virgil himself is a farmer. You know, he lost his farm, got it back again. Well, what about him as a farmer? This is it. He is actually going to give us very specific instructions about farming and how farming works. Um, we generally say that Georgic, as a literary form, begins with Virgil. Even though, now that we've read Hesiod's works and days, coming hundreds of years before Hesiod, of course, being a contemporary of Homer, um, so the Greeks were, were also aware of this distinction. Also, works and days, if you, know, if you want to focus on the works part of that, uh, go back and look, and it's mostly going to be Georgic work. Um, so just like the same way that we went back and we looked at Sappho, it was coming a little bit of after he should, she is doing a kind of pastoral too. But it is here with Virgil that it really takes on the, the meaning that it um, does. And also keep in mind that like pastoral, even though Georgic isn't nearly as popular a form um, today, um, it is the case that it, Georgic transcends genres. It's not locked into a genre, so you could have a Georgic poem, you could have a Georgic novel, um, and and you'll see those. You'll see something like um, George Eliot, Adam Bede, or Silas Marner, or very sort of Georgic works in a way. They're all about labor. Yeah. Virgil, of course, is going to be repeating the story that we've heard again and again. Specifically for him, it's coming out of the Greek tradition that, and he says, there was a time when earth yielded all of herself more freely when none begged for her gift. So he's recounting the same way that he should do, the same way that Ovid did, the same way it is in its own way described in the Bible as this wonderful prelapsarian time where everything is perfect and the earth provided for us. Yeah, so it's important to pause on this a moment, I think, because, you know, this notion that we still have today of uh, there once being a perfect relationship with the planet that people had, you know, whether it's some sort of prehistoric um, people or some indigenous people today, you know, we're set up to believe that. I mean, you can, you know, already we can see this being propounded again and again and again. And, and once this gets rolling for the next 2,000 years, it'll be repeated, you know, ad nauseum, this idea that we once had this relationship. So, you know, if someone um, asks you, or even if you yourself have wondered sometimes the question, you know, when did it all begin to go wrong environmentally? That's a tremendously loaded question because it assumes that everything was once right at some point environmentally. And, you know, why would you believe that? I mean, that's not quite in the historical record, that's for sure. And, you know, just a, a brief check to common sense. I mean, does, does it actually seem the case that when human beings first made their way out of Africa that we really, you know, made it, we really had it so good then or ever since? But anyhow, I know I've, I've said this before, and I guess I'll say it again, too. This is where this comes from, and it's a very loaded environmental belief that is still very much with us. So Virgil actually takes this further than anyone else um, and implies that it, the change from the perfect time, the prelapsarian time, the golden age to the iron age also had profound cultural implications. And he suggests that you know before all this was the case, not only did we have a better relationship with the planet, we had a better relationship with each other. You know, we didn't divide up fields, we didn't have property, everything, you know, all grain was made for the common store. So it's just a remarkable little twist that Virgil is going to add. You know, if you if you didn't find the idea of the golden age appealing. Virgil's going to add another little, uh, you know, rock to the pile, suggesting that it just, you know, everything was great at this time. Yeah, so um, 
keep in mind that this is again coming from the same part of the world the great father we saw this in genesis with god the will that the path of husbandry should not be smooth and he made human art he made humans work the fields this is the same thing that we saw in the third chapter of genesis um, and of course you know the fields no longer the earth no longer brings forth spontaneously we have to work hard to do it through georgic labor what conquers the world then the very famous phrase toiled conquered the world relentless toil if you happen to know chaucer you know the prioress has on the front of her um, embroidered on the front of her uh, her frock the phrase love conquers all that's actually riffing on an illusion on chaucer's part to virgil no it's not love that conquered all and the very romantic pretty notion to chaucer i mean to um, virgil it's toil it's work conquers all that's what it's about we have to work hard then and note even when you're talking about the farmer's tools they're the hardy rustics weapons uh, the word is arma weapons here um, the relationship and, and this is important to note between human beings and the planet now is adversarial it is all work all the time on the part of human beings and it's being cast in very warlike terms Something that you may you probably very quickly noticed, in fact, when reading the Georgics over the eclogues, eclogues are a great story. They talk metaphorically, allegorically, and all that. But you don't really get much advice on shepherding. You, know, you don't really need much, right? It's this perfect prelapsarian time. Everything sort of magically takes care of itself. Georgic labor, however, you need practical advice. So the Georgics offer that very, very practical advice, sort of nuts and bolts approach to things here. And, you know, why not? If the, the pastoral scene is something lost to the past that we can never get back again, it's really not too much need to talk about that. But the Georgic work is the work of a farmer. It is the work of someone like Virgil. I should mention, however, you know, I guess this is probably clear, but just to state it, Virgil you know from the descriptions he probably gets his hands dirty with things but he is a member of a very wealthy class he is a person that would have had slaves doing a lot of the labor for him and we get to var we're going to talk about that slave labor but um so it is his labor but not quite the the backbreaking labor we associate with farming today at least for him so Virgil has, writes for Georgics, and they are farming manuals, and they are practical. So if you go through them, they offer um, practical advice on different levels. So we read part of book one. Book one and two are concerned with farm implements. Um, and this is important because this is technology, right? We may not think of it in terms of this way in terms of you know big tractors and biocides and all that we have from the 20th century but this is technology and it's also how we till crops it's the georgic labor that we saw the the guy from the um, a brutal painting with the horse and a plow actually doing that labor of planting and all so this is farming in the sense of planting crops and orchards and um, taking care of, of plants book three is farming um, not sort of the vegetarian side but the animal husbandry side how do you take care of animals such as cattle it's a big part of it Book four, which is actually rather allegorical in, in many ways, is all about geek beekeeping. So uh, what Virgil is doing is just breaking down these different components and different parts of, um, of, of farmer's life, taking care of plants, taking care of animals, and taking care of bees. They um, can be read allegorically, um, but you know what's uh, an interesting characteristic here is that it is a husbandry manual. So if you look at the account or you recall the account of how to make a plow and all, these are very specific instructions. Virgil will continue to be read as literal, helpful manual for hundreds of years. Into the Renaissance, Virgil is going to be read as giving good advice. If you want to learn how to plow, what do you do for the next thousand or two years? Not quite 2,000, but what do you do? You pick up Virgil's Georgics and, and he gives you instruction. So it's very much a, a farming how-to manual. 
He is not the only one who does this, though. There are others, such as Varro. They produce husbandry manuals. They, they are not as poetic as Virgil's. They do not have the allegorical meaning grafted on them as well. As a consequence, they are less well known. But for our point of view, um, you know, anything, as we know, is up for grabs for us if it can help us understand the environment, even if it's not the world's most interesting literature. So sorry for the fact that you had to read it, but as we'll see directly, Varro is very important to us from an environmental point of view. So Varro's book is called On Agriculture. It's written around 36 um, BCE, before the Christian era, right about the time that Virgil was writing the Georgics. Virgil would have been aware of Varro, came a little before the Georgics, six years before. So it's tempting to think that this is somehow in Virgil's mind when he's thinking about writing the Georgics. He just read this, this incredibly comprehensive overview of agriculture by Varro. Now he writes his own with the Georgics, or soon writes his own. Virgil Varro, by the way, is not the first Latin writer to take up the subject of agriculture. Um, the oldest actual book that we have from the Roman Empire, the first Latin book, is written by Marcus Cato. It's right around 160 before the BCE. And it's also entitled um, On Agriculture, De Agricultura. And it is, you know, Significant, I think, that the first work that is, comes out of this new Latin tradition that comes is coming on the scene is this, is a very practical farming manual by Cato. So Cato and Varro, uh, they're not concerned at all with pastoral in the sense of it being this wonderful, perfect time where the earth takes care of you. They know we're not living in a golden age nothing you know no news to not news to them they're not they don't care about the golden age what they want to do is give you very practical advice today yeah um important to note that the attitudes expressed in cato and varro as we'll see and as you already know having done the reading are jarring at times with respect to how they posture themselves toward the environment. They see it as just something to use and that's all there is to it. Well, it is the case that they also thought that way toward human beings as well. And Cato mentions slaves, when to cut back on food rations, when slaves get too old to work, what's the best time to sell them and all. So it's equally jarring and it's interesting to note that once you get this sort of attitude where you separate yourselves out from, from other things, then the exploitation of them uh, becomes all the easier. So more with our friend Varro. Cato and Varro do see plants and animals in the earth as not unlike slaves. So they, um, this is not, of course, new to Roman thinking. We did see it in the myth of Gilgamesh and all. But Cato and Varro systematically lay out detailed plans to bring about the most, this in the most effective way possible. So it's not just that they think it. If you wonder, like, what are the implications of this thinking? So if you, if you think that you know, plants and animals are here and you have complete dominion over them to do whatever you want, how would that actually play out? I mean, does that actually influence the way people act and do things literally? Well, yeah. Read Cato and Varro. It does. <coughs> Excuse me. They lay out what is, in many respects, the first factory farms, at least the first factory farms that we um, have, uh, as far as I know, a sound, detailed literary account of. They probably existed before. But what really matters here is the efficient production and marketing. And so, for example, we read about birds. And uh, there is no concern for birds in any intrinsic way. It's just that these are a commodity that is being raised for uh, one thing on, uh, only, and that's profit. And, and just to situate Cato, Varro, and Virgil, um, they are wealthy landowners. They had um, agricultural holdings outside of Rome. Rome was sort of surrounded by a donut or a bagel, if you want to, um, that, that 
had farmland owned by wealthy people and of course Rome this growing major city needed food where does it come from it comes from this agricultural area if you happen to be somebody who owns this property um, you're in great shape you are in position to make a lot of money one way that you could do that is through um, uh, profitable things like raising birds and um, Cato and Var are going to tell you exactly how to do that. And the key to economy he here is scale. And um, these are these are small farms. Um, th these are not f small farms in the sense that you might think. I mean, if you think of this as being a family farm think again. The, if you look at Varro, he's talking about how to build buildings that house 5,000 birds at a time. You know, large commercial growers today for things like uh, um, turkeys and all grow maybe 18,000 in a building, in a large building. Um, this is on its way to that. This is factory farming. It's made possible through the exploitation of, farm l of slave labor. It is not individual farmers. It is um, big factories, big factory farming. And, you know, so if you read something like Michael Pollan's Omnivore's Dilemma, which is a great book that I recommend to everyone, um, Pollan sort of imagines somewhat wistfully, I think, that, you know, just a generation or two ago, we had simple family farms, and now they've all been taken over by large-scale factory farms. And what a shame. And I think he's right, and it is a shame. But this happens, has happened for thousands of years. And here you see um, large-scale farms, factory farms taking over, and specific instructions on how to do it. <coughs> Varro's attitude toward non-human animals, I think, is especially striking. So in agriculture, a passage we didn't read, he gives um, a good deal of examples, on, a good deal of discussion to making something called a sequestrium. Um, sequestrium, rather, um, which is a building separate from where the birds are being kept, where you kill the birds. Why do you do it that way? Uh, Varro has found out that if you kill the birds in the same building that they live in, they see that they're being there, that they see, you know, the killing of other birds taking place. They realize suddenly that that's what they're there for, that that's what this project is about. They then, according to Varro, becomes visibly depressed and do not eat, do not fatten up in the same way. So what you need to do is trick them and not let them know that that's why they're there. How do you do it? You create, create a separate building, a sequestered building, Obviously, that's where our word comes from in Latin, the sequestrium, and you kill the birds there, so they're none the wiser to what's happening. But think about that for a moment. Raro is aware that these are sentient beings that are can reason and feel and care, and nonetheless, he wants to. He's perfectly happy to to exploit them. It's just so much stuff which to make money, in spite of the fact that he sees that they're sentient beings. Yeah. It's remarkable, I think. I mean, it would be, on the one hand, if Faro was sort of a, um, a distant farmer, sort of an absentee landlord who didn't really know much about raising birds and all, that would be one thing if you were oblivious to the, you know, actually what they think and feel in their lives and all. But he knows full well that these are sentient feeling beings, and yet he unflinchingly ignores that fact in his pursuit of profit. I would not make this case too strongly, um, but you know, y y it is difficult to read Varro and not to to see parallels to the 20th century death camps. Um, the comparison, of course, quickly quickly breaks down. Um, but this underlying mindset that we can somehow disassociate ourselves from the feelings of others is disturbingly similar. And maybe at the root, there is this this mindset is is at the root of both things that connect us disconnect ourselves from these other creatures that we understand are feeling um, because we we just can't we can't deal with it otherwise. So I don't know. Um, yeah, again, I, I wouldn't make this case. People have made the case more strongly, but I think it's it's insensitive to the um, insensitive and inaccurate to to what happened in the 20th century with death camps. But you get the idea. It's still frightening, disturbing, um, vicious thinking. 
Yeah, you know this from the reading that we had, um, take this to its logical conclusion. You don't care about them feeling, you know, at all. He realizes, of course, that the best way to, um, to fatten these birds up more quickly is to break their legs. They're walking around, they're using up energy that they would otherwise get, you know, so make them as much as possible immobile so they fatten up even more. Of course, you're breaking their legs. I mean, this is a horrible thing to do for, for creatures that feel. Uh, today, uh, having been in factory farms, I can tell you that they don't do this, but instead they crowd so many birds into an area that they can move around very little. You're literally shoulder to shoulder with people, uh, with, with the bird next to you. So there's really no move, uh, no place to go, and it effectively, although I guess arguably perhaps more humanely than this, um, allows the same thing to take place. But again, 2,000 years ago, this is uh, being worked out. Yeah, so let's think about some things that we've talked about already this term regarding how human beings relate to a non-human life. Um, if there's no prohibition against the exploitation of other forms of life, Hombaba was that prohibition. He was there to protect the plants, trees. Um, then this mass exploitation becomes possible. There's no deity protecting the pigeons from Varro. There's, there's nothing. There's no genus Loki. There's no law. There's nothing. They, they can be exploited in a mode of complete indifference. If, you know, we start off with a fundamentally different creation story for human beings and other animals, um, that idea, plus the idea that we have complete dominion over other animals, then, you know, once we fundamentally separate ourselves out from them, once we believe that there's a divine mandate, then we can do whatever we like. Their lives sort of don't matter. And, you know, I offer this up with Varro, by the way, because there's often the case with environmentalists, um, at least there was in the, the closing decades of the 20th century, to blame all this on the Judeo-Christian tradition with, you know, and I'm even echoing it here, this idea of having dominion over animals. But, um, hey, this is another tradition altogether, and the same thing is happening here. It is not just in the Judeo-Christian, here the Greco-Roman tradition as well. But, you know, if you see yourself as fundamentally different for whatever ideological or theological reason, this opens up as a possibility. And two, if you know the physical realm doesn't really matter to you, and if um, animals are imagined as soulless, fundamentally different human beings, um, that have no place in the metaphysical realm, then arguably their um, existence here uh, becomes less important, or at least there's a risk of it becoming inconsequential doesn't have to happen this way. But you can see when you begin to move these things together, like this belief that the physical realm doesn't matter, that we have dominion over animals, that created, we're created differently. When you start putting all these together, you set up conditions that allow something like borrow to come on the scene. So a few concluding remarks. It's not, I think, uh, coincidental that they both appear right about the same time. Um, that, you know, a new way of thinking about non-human life is emerging here. Um, and we see ourselves essentially adversarial to the, the earth and its life. You know, we have to, we have to eck our way out through our own uh, labor. Um, and that's just all there is to it. And as in the Genesis account, this is decreed by God. If you remember that from Virgil's Georgics, that God decreed that we should work this way. So this this is the conclusion of that thinking, or this is the, the you know, it doesn't have to be that way, but when you have all these conditions ripe uh, together, then you're ripe for something like Varro's, uh, Virgil's Georgics, or the actual implications, of, the actual application of it with someone like Varro.
Yeah. So, you know, once you have this Georgic ethic in place, you don't care about non-human beings, you don't care about their sentience and all, um, then really the question is, how do you do this efficiently? I mean, now that we can do it, now that we're supposed to do it, how do you do it efficiently? And in Varro, you see that being worked out. There's just no concern for anything other than brutal efficiency um, for the bottom line, for profit. And profit is written large all over Varro. Um, you know, you could say that um, this was, I mean, this was pioneered by Cato. It's talked about, of course, by Virgil. But in Varro, you see it taken to a whole new level. Um, this is, you know, this, this will still pale in comparison to what will happen in the 20th century and, and, and the centuries leading up to it. But the mindset is there. In some sense, you know, why we're doing what we're doing in this course, looking at underlying ideology and thinking, is to see how that thinking can actually impact the natural world. Here's an example of it written large in Varro. Yeah. Um, it's tempting to read Virgil's um, eclogues and to think about environmental consciousness and how he was aware of things. It's, tempo, it's, it's tempting to read Meliboas's very, you know, impassioned pleas to, to Titerus to become aware of the environment, to care about it, to take care of it and all. But, you know, um, he then also is in this other tradition coming out of uh, uh, the, the shows with the Georgics coming out of Cato and Varro, which is very different as well. So uh, be aware of that, that it's, um, and, and more generally be aware that, you know, when you, you think someone like Virgil, if you read the first eclogue, is, is sort of a proto-environmentalist, there's something to that, but his, his understanding of environmental consciousness and all is very different than ours, and it would be interesting to think about the kind of life that Meliboas actually had lived on his farm and exactly what it was like, and um, in fact, who knows, it could have been very much like Cato and Varro. So that ends Lecture 7, and that will take us away from um, the Roman culture directly. So with, ex uh, with Lecture 8, we're going to be, let's see if we can jump over to our, our larger picture. We're going to be moving into the medieval period in the process. We're out of northern Africa and the Mediterranean. We're going to be in Europe proper. In fact, we're going to mainly be in England from here on out because... This is an English course, and we're concerned how um, that literature affected us today. So, yeah, be prepared to, to move ahead a few centuries and, um, and over quite a few hundred miles. Okay, that's the end of Lecture 7.